This is a GCSE video about evaporation and energy changes. Don't forget to visit my website, loveatphysics.com, for some exam questions and subscribe to this channel. In the previous video, we talked about the differences between liquids, solids, and gases. And we said that liquids, the particles are very close together, and if we give them energy, they, they can turn into a gas, and that is called either evaporation or boiling. In this video, we're going to look at evaporation. We all know um, with evaporation that if there's a puddle of water outside on the road, for example, then after a certain amount of time, it will have dried up or all the water will have disappeared. And what's happening is that water is evaporating into the atmosphere. So if you imagine this is our puddle, these are our, these are our liquid particles, the liquid water, and they're moving around past each other like that. <clears throat> Every so often, one of these particles is going to have slightly more energy than one of the other particles. They don't all have exactly the same amount of energy. It's a bit of a distribution. Some of them have more energy and some of them have less energy. Now the particles at the very surface, if they have enough energy, they can escape and become a gas. Now, they own, it doesn't need for all of the particles to have this energy, just one. Now, if this particle has enough energy to evaporate, it changes into a gas. And then maybe another particle will have enough energy to evaporate. Now, it's only the particles with the most amount of energy that are evaporating. All the rest are staying behind. So if you imagine the ones that are left behind are the colder ones. These ones are the super hot ones. They're the, they're the most energy. And these ones have less energy. So if we lose, and we continue to lose by evaporation, the particles with the most energy, then the average amount of energy here is going to decrease. We're losing the particles with the most energy, and all we're left with is the particles with less energy. So the average amount of energy here is less. Now we can imagine that less, it's hard to imagine energy on its own, but if we imagine the energy as temperature, then if we've got less energy in the puddle, then we've got a lower temperature. It's, it's cooling down, it's getting colder. Now we see this every day. When we sweat, some of our sweat evaporates like this, it turns into gas, and the particles with the most energy, the sweat particles with the most energy are the ones that evaporate, and so they leave behind the particles with the, less, the least energy, and that cools you down. Now it takes a little bit of energy <clears throat> for those particles to turn into a gas, and they take it with them. And we can calculate that energy. There's a way to calculate how much energy it takes to convert a liquid into a gas. And that equation is this. Energy is mass times L. And in this case, L is the latent heat of vaporization. Now, the latent heat of vaporization is what it's called when something goes from a liquid to a gas, or from a gas to a liquid, the energy is the same. Except when it goes from a gas to a liquid, the energy is released instead of absorbed. So the latent heat of vaporization is talking about the transition between gas and liquid. <coughs> the latent heat of fusion is, one, is what we use when we're talking about going from a liquid to a solid or a solid to a liquid. So I'll just write fusion down here as well in brackets. Latent heat of fusion is solid to liquid or liquid to solid. Latent heat of vaporization is liquid to gas or gas to liquid. So we know the amount of energy is dependent on the latent heat of vaporization. Now that's different for every chemical. And the mass. Basically, if you have more particles, then you need more energy to turn them into a gas, which makes a lot of sense. So, when we turn a liquid into a gas, we use a certain amount of energy, and that energy is taken away from the liquid, and so the liquid cools down. Now, we have a similar formula to see how much things warm up by. Now, you might have um, once eaten maybe a chocolate chip cookie or something like that from the, from the fridge. 
And it feels like the chocolate chips are colder than the rest of the cookie. Now that's because chocolate chips can hold more energy than the rest of the cookie, or alternatively, they need more energy to heat up and your mouth provides that energy so they feel cold. Now how much energy something needs to warm up is a similar equation to the one that we've just seen. The energy needed to heat something up by a certain change of temperature, this is a Greek letter delta and it means change. So the change of temperature is the mass in kilograms times C, which is the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. So if you have one kilogram of a substance raised by one degree C, then it takes whatever C is amount of joules. Now C for water is about 4,200. So that what that means is to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree C, it takes 4,200 joules of energy. If you want to raise it by two degrees C, then it's 8,400. Or if you want to raise two kilograms by one degree C, then it's 8,400 joules. So the energy you need depends on the mass. It depends on the specific heat capacity of the liquid or the solid or whatever it is, and how much you want to change the temperature by. So this equation we use for calculating the change in temperature when something is not changing state. This equation is for the latent heat. Now, latent heat means that the substance is changing state. So you have two slightly different equations. One of them involves changing temperature, and it's obvious which one that is because it's got changing temperature as part of the equation. And the other one is about changing state. Now, latent heat, if we go back to talking about uh, energy changes, sorry, phase changes, latent heat means hidden heat. And why, why would that be called hidden heat? Well, if you plot a graph of uh, heating up a substance, so in this case, we're going to heat up some ice, some imaginary ice. And if the ice is at minus 10 degrees and we start heating it up, we start adding energy, then the temperature will increase. Now, the temperature will increase until we get to zero. Now, at zero degrees C, ice is going to melt. Now, what happens to the graph there is it flattens out for a little while while the ice is melting. And then once all the ice is melted, it starts to increase again. The temperature starts to increase again. And then when it gets to 100 degrees, the water starts to evaporate. And then once it's evaporated, all of the water has turned into gas. Or, sorry, it starts to boil at 100 degrees. Once it's all boiled, then the graph starts to increase again. The temperature starts to increase again. Now, these two places are where the phase is changing, where the state is changing. Now, the reason for that is we're still heating it, we're still adding energy, but here, the temperature is incre isn't increasing. We're adding energy, but the temperature's not increasing. Now, that is because all of that energy is going into breaking those bonds that makes a solid a solid and starting those particles moving past each other like a liquid does. So all of that energy, and that energy is the latent heat of fusion, all of the energy is going into melting the ice. Then the energy goes into raising the temperature of the water. And then here, the energy is going into evaporating the liquid, the latent heat of vaporization. 
Now you can see that it's taking longer there. The time is greater for the latent heat of vaporization. That means that the energy required is more. If we're adding energy at a constant rate, it takes longer to vaporize all of the liquid. And so the latent heat of vaporization is greater than the latent heat of fusion. Now, what you can also see here is the gradient here is steeper than the gradient here. Now, what that means is that the specific heat capacity of steam is less than the specific heat capacity of water. In other words, it's easier or it takes less energy to increase the temperature of steam than it does to increase the temperature of water. So the gradient of those things relates to the specific heat capacity and how long the plateaus are relate to the latent heats. And so you can tell a lot from a temperature time graph of something melting or evaporating. Now there's one more thing you need to know about at IGCSE level, and that is called the thermal capacity. Now, the thermal capacity is very similar to specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity deals with materials. So the specific heat capacity of a particular material. So it doesn't matter how much of that material you've got, you've still got the same specific heat capacity. However, thermal capacity is just about an object. So thermal capacity is the energy required to raise that object by one degree C. So the thermal capacity here, CT, the energy required to change the temperature of any object by one degree C. So if you have two things, one of them, uh, they're both made of the same material, like let's say aluminium, and you've got one kilogram of aluminium here and two kilograms of aluminium here, they will have the same specific heat capacity because they're made of the same material, but they will have different thermal capacities because the thermal capacity is just for that particular object. That's the difference. So an important difference, thermal capacity and specific heat capacity. You've also seen about how to calculate the latent heat of vaporization and fusion. And also you've seen how evaporation cools things down.